a little bit surprised Cody isn't here, but uh, whatever. Anyway, uh, we're do what? He probably yeah. Well, that's a good sign. I mean, Caltech students need sleep, and you don't get enough. I shouldn't tell this story, but um, it was like two years after I graduated before I could get less than nine hours of sleep in a night. It's like I, I, you really go into sleep debt at this place. And when I was a sophomore, I was basically pulling like one to two all-nighters a week. And third term, I got appendicitis because my body was just wearing down so much. And I went into the hospital to get my appendix taken out. And the doctors, you know, put me on general anesthesia so that they could operate and all of that. And then I didn't wake up <laughs> after I was supposed to. And the doctors were getting more and more worried because I was supposed to be asleep for like six hours. And it was like 14 hours later, I finally woke up. And the doctor's like, what's going on? Did we do something wrong? And my mom says, no, he's just really, really tired. <laughs> and so just be aware that you are, you are incurring uh, penalties on your body and you will be paying for them for some time. But it all works out. You'll live. So anyway, <laughs> that's why we don't make the homework any easier. I guess we're part of the problem. But anyway, so we were talking about uh, indexes and B-trees and I want to encourage you to review the last lecture material because there were a lot of terms in there that are very valuable to know. Primary indexes are indexes that are built on the same search key as the data, you know, the, the data file itself, so it's a sequential file or a hashing file. Um, then you have secondary indexes, which are most of the time what we actually have are secondary indexes that are built on some different search key from the data file that they're indexing. And we started talking about B trees, and in particular B plus trees. So when I say B plus, or when I say B tree, I mean B plus tree because I'm just lazy. So, uh, and the reason why we like them is because of this structure here, and you'll see it when we get into more detail today. The indexing structure itself is separate from the data. And this has a very big benefit for us because it allows us to simplify the management of this data structure. Standard B trees mix these two things. They will have uh, inner nodes and leaf nodes, and inner nodes can also contain data. And part of the challenge of that is that it makes it challenging to identify what the cost will be of looking up a particular record. B plus trees are very easy. It's the depth of the tree. That's all I need to know about. The depth of the tree is how much, how many IOs I need to perform to access a particular record. So that's why we prefer B plus trees greatly and why most database implementations choose B plus trees as the B tree variant they implement. So tree nodes have up to n children. This is a little bit of review. And the benefit of this design is that n typically is in the hundreds. So you think of an 8K page and a key size that might be 4 bytes or 8 bytes. Let's say it's 8 bytes because we have large data sets now. And the record pointer, let's say that it's also 8 bytes. So now you have 16 bytes, divide that into 8K. You have a large branching factor in your tree. And so that means that your tree gets to be very shallow and very broad. And that means very few IOs to look up values. Nodes generally follow this structure. So we have pointers with keys in between them. And these search key values basically specify what is pointed to by the corresponding pointers. So um, I, like I have on here, the, the keys are in increasing order. So K1 is less than or equal to K2, and that's K, uh, less than or equal to K3, and so forth, all the way through. Uh, it is possible to have duplicate key values. We won't when we build most of our indexes. We do have certain indexes, like foreign key indexes, which may have non-unique values. But actually, that's not true. For all of the um, indexes we build in CS122, all of our values will be distinct. And we'll talk about how we do that, uh, particularly on the assignment when we get to that, uh, you know, the details of that. Leaf nodes. The PI is a record, or it points to a record with the key value KI. So P1 is a record with the search key value K1, P2 is a pointer to the record with the search key value of K2, and so forth. So it's very easy. This is the, the bottom level where we're saying this is the record corresponding to the key value that I have recorded here. And of course, we have various situations that can occur. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a bit of the punchline. What we can actually do is group together the pointer and the key so that every box, like P1K1, is distinct from P2K2, is distinct from P3K3, 
And we use that technique to basically make every record that we record in our index distinct. Because you won't have two entries pointing to the same tuple in the same index. There's no reason to do that. Each tuple is only referenced once by the index, so the, the combination of P1 and K1 is distinct from P2, K2, and so forth. Well, like I said, we'll get into that in more detail in the assignment itself. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this stuff because we talked about it a little bit last time. Leaf nodes have this wonderful thing that the last pointer in the node is a pointer to the next leaf node. And they are ordered in sequence, so this allows us to do range queries or anything where we need to traverse the data in sequence based on the search key. So within nodes, key values are kept in sorted order. Leaves contain non-overlapping regions of key record associations. And so basically it allows us to traverse the records in the, in the data file in sequential order just by running through the leaf nodes. Yes? So the leaf nodes, but the leaf nodes do not contain the tuple data? The leaf nodes do not contain the tuple data itself. Now th there's an important caveat there. They contain search key values. And so if you, if you and this is why we talked about um, sometimes you can build an index and then evaluate a query entirely against the index because if the query only references values in the search keys, we can do that. It's kind of really neat. But yes, it does not include the whole tuples data. And so if we need to access things that are outside of the search key, then we have to follow that P whatever, get the record, and look at its contents. And guess what? That incurs disk seats. So, for example, if we have a grouping and aggregation and we use all but one of our attributes in our grouping and aggregation are from the search key, but there's one attribute that we have to get from looking at the tuple, a lot of times that will cause a database to not use the index because having to go and access things and incurring the, the corresponding disk seeks from that uh, will be prohibitive. We'll talk about some of those things Hopefully next time. I don't remember if we talk about it, but at least we'll talk about it on the assignment. So at least you'll be able to see it there. Okay, non-leaf nodes. So since <clears throat> the keys and the pointers correspond to each other, basically it allows us to select a subtree that will contain the value that we're looking for. If it's in the index, it'll be in the subtree. So like I say here, P sub i points to a subtree containing search key values of at least K sub i minus 1 and less than k sub i. So if we want to find a value, and we, we have our value that we're looking up, and we look and compare it to k1, and it's less than k1, we follow p1. But if it's at least k1, but less than k2, we follow p2. If it's at least k2, but less than k3, we follow p3. And so we can use that to go into the subtree that contains the value. So you can see that it's just like a binary tree, except that we're chopping it down by a lot more than just half each time. So that's the real neat part of this. And of course, if it is at least k sub n minus 1, we follow the rightmost pointer, p sub n. So this is the, the way that I like to think about it because it makes it easier to think about. p1 is a subtree with search keys in this range. Now obviously, if this non-leaf has a sibling, then that will constrain the minus infinity. Uh, if it has a right sibling, that'll constrain the plus infinity, but you guys get the idea. This allows us to navigate our non-leaves to get down to the node that actually has the values that we care about. Okay, now um, any questions so far? We're going to see plenty of examples, so if you don't fully get it, then you'll probably get it as soon as we start seeing some examples. The other constraint about B plus trees is that <laughs> all of these nodes have to be at least 50% full. Now, they don't have to be 100% full, which is really nice because when we insert records, we frequently have situations where we can add the record and we don't have to create new uh, pages in our file because we have room in existing pages. And this is really nice because this is a sequential file, just like the ones we were talking about before where each tuple had an extra pointer on it and we thought, oh, this is terrible because now I'm going to have to start inserting things in a different order than the physical layout of the file. B trees avoid this problem by keeping around a lot of extra space. It's conceivable that of all your search keys, however much space they take, the index file could be twice that size because each node could be just half full. It could also be exactly that size if everything is full, but then you have to worry about insertions taking more space. 
The root node is the one exception. Simply because there's a lot of situations where we just don't have enough data for the root node to be 50% full. And so, again, we'll see this example both today and on Wednesday when we go through deletion because the root node frequently just doesn't have enough data uh, for it to be full. Okay, yeah, so non-leaf nodes, we're going to talk about fullness in terms of the number of pointers. Not every B-tree implementation does this because... Uh, for example, if your search key includes variable length strings, your keys will be different sizes. And so the number of pointers you can fit in one node will be different than the number of pointers you can fit in another node. But uh, for now, for the sake of simplicity, we'll talk about it in terms of the number of pointers. So like I guess here, non-leaf nodes have to have at least n over 2, round it up to the next integer, they have to have at least that many pointers which means that since each pointer, or I should say each pair of pointers, sandwich is a key, will have that many keys minus one. So a tree with n equals five, n over two is gonna be two and a half. We, we round that up, we take the ceiling of it, and so we say three pointers and two keys, that's the minimum for this tree. Now if you have a B tree that has this few pointers and keys, you probably shouldn't use a B tree because we're already, you know, we have nodes that are already way too full. Typically, we'd want n to be at least 100. And preferably 500, 600 would make us super happy. Because then we have a very shallow tree, even when we have, uh, you know, 100 million records that we're indexing. And so that's one of the funny things about the B-tree code that I give you guys. To actually exercise multi-level B-trees, I have to make the keys several hundred bytes just to start triggering the need to have multiple levels. But typically, we're going to try to keep our records as small as possible so that n is very, very large, and then that keeps our, our trees very shallow. Okay, yeah, leaf nodes always use p sub n to point to the next leaf node, so we don't count that <coughs> since it's part of the data structure. And so we basically say that um, p1 through pn minus 1 are the pointers that we actually care about. So again, p sub i points to a row with value k sub i, so we must have at least n minus 1 over 2, round that up, pointers and keys. And we have the same number of pointers as keys because each key has a corresponding pointer with it. So tree with n equals 4, so 4 minus 1 is 3, over 2 is 1 and a half. We round that up to 2. And so we need to have two pointers and two keys minimum. And we'll still have a third pointer that points to the next leaf, but we don't count that in this estimation. Okay, So this is just for the sake of discussion, because when we get into the NanoDB B-tree implementation, it'll all be done by size. And what we'll do is we'll try to move approximately half of the data into another node, or we'll try to keep everything at least half full. That's kind of the goal that we'll try to pursue with the NanoDB B-tree. But this approach of counting pointers makes it easy to discuss examples. So here's, a, uh, here's what we're going to look at. Tree with n equals 4. So we can fit 4 pointers and 3 keys into any given node, leaf or non-leaf. Now again, remember that leaves are separate. Leaves have a slightly different way of being interpreted than non-leaves. We have two levels of non-leaves, and then we have one level of leaf nodes. And you can see that everything is, is as full as it needs to be. So non-leaves have to have at least 2 pointers and 1 key, and leaves have to have, uh, I think, yeah, two pointers and two keys. And again, this is the index file part. The tuples themselves that are pointed to will be somewhere else. They'll be in a table file, and that's why we care about things like slotted pages and not deleting uh, slots when there's other slots following them because what we'll actually store in the B-tree file is that offset, or I'm sorry, page number offset thing, and that will reference a slot. And that slot needs to not change when we delete other slots. So uh, we just need to be careful of that kind of thing. But you can see this is sort of how we have this all laid out. Are there any questions? You can see that keys are in increasing order in the various nodes and so forth. We're also going to enforce that search key values are unique just because that keeps our lives simple. Again, uh, it's very easy to extend this to the general case where search key values are not unique. 
you just may have a run of tuples. And so um, the, the, the um, consequence of constraining our keys in this way means that when we get down to a particular leaf node, either that leaf node contains our value or the value is not in the index. If we had a situation where we could have runs of non-distinct keys, then we might jump into a part of the index and we might need to scan forward until we find what we're looking for. So just be aware of that. Since we're constraining this, we don't have to worry about runs of, of uh, entries in the leaves. We can just drop into one leaf and we'll find it. And then, of course, since these are almost always secondary indexes, we will also specify that it's dense. Okay? Remember that we can have sparse indexes, but the sparse index is only feasible when it's a primary index because we, again, may have to search to find the record in the table file that we're looking for. But in the case that it's a secondary index, it has to be dense. Every record has to be represented. Okay. Now, querying. How would we query this thing? We want to find the table record using the search key value v. Hopefully you'll see how you can do this very easily based on what I described before of the sub-ranges that each one of these pointers will point to. Okay. If I want to find pit, well I come to the first, the root node, and I say well pit is less than rat, <laughs> so I need to follow the left pointer. If it was at least rat, then I'd have to follow the right pointer. So I follow the left pointer. Pit is greater than dot, so I move forward. Pit is greater than off. I can't move forward anymore, so I follow the right pointer, and I end up in a leaf. And I say, okay, pit is either in this leaf or it's not here at all. And I scan through the entries, and lo and behold, I find pit, and I use that to pull out the record from the table file that has that uh, value of pit in it. Okay? So pretty easy. That's the conceptual thing to do. So given the value v, we follow the tree structure to find the exact leaf node. And just by virtue, like I said, of the fact that all of our entries are distinct, we don't have to do any more searching once we get to the leaf. If we had uh, more complex situations, we might need to scan forward a little bit. But we don't have to in our discussions. Okay, so navigate non-leaves separately from the leaf nodes because they are different in their contents. Non-leaves just say what part of the subtree we need to look at. The leaves reference actual records. So he says here, a given non-leaf node start with i is 1, because we always start with 1 in databases. I don't know why. Uh, if the value is less than the key sub i that we're looking at, then we go ahead and follow the left pointer down to the uh, subregion of the file that we care about. Uh, if it's equal, then we follow the right pointer. So we've done less than and equal. Now, if it's greater than, we don't know if we should follow the right pointer yet. It depends on if it's the last pointer. So we go ahead and try to increment i. And if we can't, then we follow the right pointer. Otherwise, we increment i and repeat our tests. Okay. It's pretty straightforward. Are there any questions about this? Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about this, and you'll see this when you get into the, the B-tree implementation, is that remember that if we have a search key, this is a sequential file. So if we had a search key with multiple columns in it, the contents of the file are ordered on the search key, but they're also ordered on any prefix of the search key. So if our search key is ABC, this is also ordered on A and B, and it's also ordered on A. And so if we do an index lookup just on A, our comparisons need to be able to handle those situations where we're saying, yeah, you know, I know that your, your search key you know, you're talking to the index. I know your search key is ABC, but I only care about A right now. So you sort of say, hey, index, give me the stuff with A equals this, and then you can navigate that way. So the result is you need to be able to have a comparison operation that compares partial tuples. So, you know, yes, search keys have three values in them, but I only care about ordering on the first value. So I just compare on the first value. So you have um, various little nuances to the implementation, which are not complicated. You just need to, to be aware of them. Okay? NanoDB already incorporates the ability to order on partial tuples and things like that. So you, can, uh, you don't have to write that part. It's all actually going to be provided for you. I try to make sure that you guys get the boring infrastructure stuff. Um, it's just straightforward. It's just uh, kind of tedious to, to work it all out. Okay, once we reach a leaf node, so non-leaves we navigate in a particular way. And then once we reach the leaf node, we just search through the leaf until we find the entry that we care about. 
Once we find it, we have the tuple. Or I should say we have the pointer to the tuple, and then we can go ahead and resolve that to get the tuple itself. Okay, any questions? So that's lookups. I think I have, uh, yeah, the algorithm here. So C is the root node. Well, C is a non-leaf node. You pull out the number of pointers. You start with I is 1. <coughs> you search through that node. If the value, the search key value is less than K sub I, then you go ahead and descend into P sub I. Is that an I or a J? I can never tell with my font. I think that's an I. So anyway, but you can see, you, you go ahead and say, I'm going to descend to the left pointer. Otherwise, if it's equal to the key value that I'm looking at, I descend into the right pointer. And obviously, you go back and start again. Uh, otherwise, you move forward. And if you can move forward, then you repeat your test. Otherwise, you go ahead and follow the final pointer. Now, you keep repeating this, and you eventually end up in a leaf, unless your bee tree is horribly mangled. And thankfully, that's one thing that we always try to give you all, is um, code to verify the, the correctness of the bee tree, because it's just so complicated to implement these data structures in files that... I don't want to leave you hanging with that. So you get a little bit of validation code. It, it runs like six or seven different tests to make sure that the uh, B tree is, is actually valid. But anyway, once you end up in a leaf node, then you can just scan through the leaf to see if the value is in there. And if it is, you return the tuple pointer. Otherwise, you say, I can't find it. Okay? Super simple. There's not really much complexity to this. Is everybody with me? Is it starting? It's going to start getting harder now. <laughs> it's going to start getting worse. Now, um, there is one little uh, thing to mention here as well, which is that we have this constraint that, remember, if our search key value is less than K1, we go left. If it is at least K1, then we go right. And we have this whole thing that we go right on equality. And I just want to make sure that you realize that you don't have to implement it this way. Not every B-tree implementation does. Sometimes they go left on equality. And so you have to think about these things. It, it obviously affects a lot of details of the implementation. You have to think about how you implement your range queries. You have to think about various things like that. But um, it's easy to think about going right on equality, and that's the convention that we follow in CS122. But just be aware that you may run into B-tree implementations that don't follow that uh, convention. Okay? <clears throat> okay, insertion. So insertion, 99% of the time, if you have a high branching factor, you're super happy because you don't have to think. So you insert into an empty B-tree index. Uh, the root is also a leaf. And this is an important thing, is that the root node will either be a leaf or a non-leaf. If your index is empty, or it's only got a handful of values, then the root node will be a leaf, which makes it really simple because you don't have to do any non-leaf structural navigation. You just, you're just you already looking for the value that you want from the index. So we want to insert cat into an empty index, and that's what it would look like. How hard was that? Okay. And that's our root node, so that's easy enough. The important detail here is that we don't have enough data for this node to be at least half full. And so we don't care. This is the one situation, this is why the root frequently will not have at least 50% of its data present. Um, just because we don't have enough, you know, the index may not be large enough to populate the root to that size. Everything else should be at least 50% full. Okay, um, yeah, so as long as there's uh, room in the node, then we go ahead and insert another value. So I'm going to add bib to the index now. But I have this, remember, I have this constraint that the keys need to be in increasing order. So can cat stay where it is? That's right, I have to slide it over. So, I slide cat to the right, and I put bib in front of it. And now our root node looks like this. Okay, any questions? Now, the one thing that I just, this is like totally miscellaneous, non sequitur, trivia stuff. But the first time I gave this example, uh, a student went and searched on the internet, and it turns out that there um, are cat bibs. <laughs> I had no idea that this existed. Does anybody know why people would put a bib on a cat? Yeah, this is where the pictures outside my door come from. Anybody know? The reason why is to keep the cats from catching birds. Because like when it gets down to pounce, like the bib will roll underneath its body, and its front paws will be on 
the bib. And then when it tries to pounce, well, I don't know who would do this to a cat. I always cheer when our cat catches birds. So, because um, I'm like, yeah, go cat. And there's tons of birds. And uh, so when we put out bird feeders, my wife is like, we need more bird feeders. And I'm like, I call them cat feeders. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's Bib Cat. And that's why there's pictures of Bib Cat outside my door. But um, anyway, yes? You should be quoted. I should be quoted. I, well, it is recorded, so it, it could be. But anyway, yeah, so that's Bib Cat. Any, any questions? <laughs> All right, yeah, you can go look. That is one of the happiest cats I've ever seen. Now, let's say that we fill up this leaf node. We keep adding stuff to it. So now we've added gut to our root. And we have big cat gut. And remember, that last pointer has a special purpose. It points to the next leaf. So we can't really use it. We don't have room for another key anyway. So let's say that we want to add dot. It would, you know, dot would go before gut. If we're going to keep these in order. But we don't have room for it anymore. So what we do is we take that leaf node and we split it into two. And we put half of the stuff in the left node, the, the old node, the old node, and the other half of it into the new node. And we can now chain them together. That last pointer becomes valuable because now we can say, okay, if you want the thing that comes after cat, follow this pointer and it'll give you the next thing. And then the next node contains the rest. Now... Once we do this, bibcat can no longer be the root, right? Because now we have two nodes, and dot gut will not be accessible directly. So now we need to introduce <clears throat> a new root. Now the question is, what value should go between the two pointers to our two leaves in our new root? Who likes dot? Who thinks dot should go in? It turns out that that is the general rule, is that when we split a node into two nodes, the first value in the right node is the one that goes into the parent. Because if you think about it, if it's less than that value, you follow the left pointer. So to get into the, the left node. If it is at least that value, then you go into the right node. So dot would be the thing that should go up into the new parent node. Now, the way that I state this, I'm not super satisfied with the way that I state this, so that's why I put a note on it. When you split a note into two, the, the note is split, and the old note is usually the left note, and the new note is the right note. Um, when you split it, then you promote the right note's first key value up to the parent. Okay? And this is a general thing. Like, if you had some leaf that you split in a larger index, the right node's first key gets propagated up to the parent. That's a general rule. But um, I say here the new node's first key and not the right node's first key. That's a part that's a little bit imprecise. Um, really, because you could split it and create a new node on the left if you really wanted to. Um, there's actually a really good reason why you don't split left, though. Does that, can anybody think of a reason why we wouldn't want to split and have the new node be on the left? Think about a larger tree. Who points to Bibcat? We don't really know. So it's really easy to split right because then I don't have to update, you know, it's a singly linked list of, of these leaf nodes. So I can update Bibcat's pointer and I can update DotGut's pointer. But if I split left, then I have to go figure out who my, my previous node is and then update it. So it's just easier to split right. This is why we generally split right. You'll see a lot of constraints where it's like, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And it's like, oh, because that would incur a huge number of IOs tweaking this data structure. The rules for file system data structures are very different than in-memory data structures. In in-memory data structures, we could do all the reorganizing we want. That's like we have hash file or you know hash tables where we're perfectly happy to completely rearrange the hash table. We never can do that kind of stuff in file system data structures because it's just too expensive. So we do things like this, split right, because we only have to touch a few nodes. Okay, if there isn't a parent node, then we are splitting the root node. And again, this is the kind of thing that you have to think about in your B-tree implementation. Okay, I am the root, but I am being split, so I need to create a new root. And that new root has to take my node pointer and the right sibling's pointer, and it needs to separate them with the right sibling's first key value. 
Okay? So it's pretty straightforward. So this is our node. So we had bibcat and dot gut, and now we're adding off to it. So that goes into the right node. Um, what you do when you're inserting is you always go down to the leaf that should contain the value. So we would use uh, off to navigate the non-leaf. So we say off is greater than dot, but there are no more keys, so we follow the right pointer, and that's the leaf that it should go into. Now we want to insert pit. And again, we have a situation where we can't do it, and so we end up splitting the right node again. And we have bibcat, dot gut, and off pit. And you can see, that, again, we promote the right sibling or the new node's first key value up to the parent. And so you end up with the root containing dot and off. Any questions? All right. So this algorithm is pretty straightforward to implement. Um, now, we've only split leaves so far. <laughs> and that's kind of an important detail. We haven't split non-leaves. Non-leaves can get really uh, crazy confusing. So uh, like I say here, it's straightforward to implement, splitting a leaf. Uh, some, some implementations do this. I'm actually sorely tempted to do this in NanoDB because it is pretty freaking complicated to do it. Well, you see here, L is a full leaf node. We want to add a key and its associated record pointer P to node L. Um, what you could do is copy all of the node's contents into a temporary memory block that's large enough to hold the new key and pointer as well because it can hold it. And then you use that temporary block to create the new leaf, copy the, the keys and pointers in, and update the other guy appropriately from it. Okay, like you said, you create a new empty leaf node L prime, uh, set, okay, let's see, L prime's P sub n to, to L's P sub n. So the old node was pointing to somebody. We want the new node, since it's now in front of the old node, to point to that thing now. So that's the first part. And then set L.pn to be L prime. So we're chaining the new node into the existing nodes. You all have done insertion into a linked list. That's basically all we're doing here, except it's pages of a file instead of uh, in-memory nodes. And this is where that temporary memory area comes in really helpful. Uh, you clear the left node. Just wipe it out. Copy a certain subrange of those pointers into the left node, and then you copy the remainder into the right node. Okay. Um, NanoDB doesn't do it precisely this way. What it does is it just copies a chunk of uh, values into the right node, uh, just to make it simple. But it turns out that there's other complexities from the way NanoDB does it, so um, this, is, this is a pretty straightforward way of doing it. You know it's bad when the slide is this detailed. So yeah, insert value k, pointer p if the tree is empty. L is a new empty leaf node. Um, yeah, that one's easy enough. Otherwise, like I said, you navigate the non-leaf structure to find the leaf that it should go into. If that leaf has less than the maximum number of keys, just dump it into the leaf. No problem. Insert in leaf does that. <coughs> you can see it down below. So if the key is less than, uh, let's see how we do this. Yeah, okay, so if the key is smaller than the first key, slide everything over and put it in there. Otherwise, you find the largest case of I. So you could, you could rewrite this in a uh, loop if you wanted to, which is how NanoDB does it. So find the largest case of I that's less than the new key, and then insert that stuff after the, the um, key that you found. Now you also notice that if we don't have space, that's the else clause above, uh, split node L into L and L prime using the mechanism we just described. And then we figure out where it's supposed to go. Um, and then we find the smallest key in L prime. So that's the first key in L prime, the new node. And that gets propagated up to the parent. And so now we have this magical insert in parent thing. This one's a little bit confusing. So like it says here, insert in parent, node N, value K prime, node N prime. What that triple actually is, is that's, um, so node n should already be in the parent. And so what you're saying is where you find node n, there will be stuff after it. You need to find that position and then insert k prime and n prime 
So slide the other stuff over and insert n prime and k prime into that space. So that's why we have these three arguments. The first argument is already in the parent. The other two need to be added to the parent. So if n is the root of the tree, then we need to create a new root. So that's what the first part does. R is a new empty non-leaf node. Set its contents to just be n, k prime, n prime. That's the entire contents of the new root. And we record that that's the root now. So you can see that somewhere there's going to be a value saying this is the root of the tree. Now if, if we don't need to create a new root, then we have all the other fun stuff, which is the possibility that the parent node may also be full. So P is parent N. So we figure out what is the parent of node N. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, the root, no, the root should have at least two pointers. Yeah, the root should always have at least two pointers and one key. If it only had one pointer, then the node it points to should be the root. And so that is the situation where if we have a, a root with only one pointer in it, we throw it out and we update our, our schema page or our header page to point to the new root of the tree. That is allowing us to collapse the tree's depth down when we reduce the amount of contents in it. We'll talk about that next lecture. But yeah, that's a very good question. We should, we should always have at least two pointers in our root. Otherwise, there's no reason to have the root. Okay, so P is the parent of N. So remember that N is the node that we were just updating on our left side of our algorithm. So uh, we figure out what the parent of N is. And once we have that, then we say if P has space for another pointer, then just go ahead and add it in. And again, that n k prime n prime triple is very important. We find where n appears, we push things over a little bit, and we put k prime and n prime into the new space we create, because that's where it belongs. Funnily enough, that will magically keep our keys in order in our non-leaf nodes. So it's kind of a it's kind of a neat thing that it just emerges from the way that we manage our leaf node. Now we have a problem because the parent may also fill up, and that's what the last else part does. Copy the parent node P to a temporary block that's large enough for our new K prime and N prime. And insert those in just after N again. We push things over, make a space, put it in. And we create a new node P prime. So now we're splitting a parent node into two, which is kind of neat. You can imagine situations where you know, you're adding data to a node, and then all of a sudden it like splits bacteria-like into two nodes. And there's a new parent that emerges. And then you fill it up, fill it up, fill it up, fill it up and it splits again. And split, 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 split. You know, you keep splitting leaves until the parent fills up, and then the parent splits. And then you create a new root. And then parents fill up and maybe split and split until that root fills up, and then you need to split it again, and you add a new root. So that's basically what's going on here. So we create a new node, P prime, clear the left node, which already had data, copy data from our temporary space into the left node, P1, K1 through whatever. We divide it in half. And then we copy the remainder of that data into the right parent that we just created, P prime. And now we have a new problem. That new parent, or the, the parent above those guys, needs to get that value. So that's the K double prime. <laughs> oh, it gets complicated. This is why B tree implementation is miserable. And uh, that's why I give you most of the implementation, because implementing this stuff is pretty grungy. But you can see that we recursively call insert in parent to say, hey, these parent nodes just changed, so the parent of those guys needs to be changed as well, or possibly created. Okay. So this is a little bit complicated. I think that's all I'm going to say about it, because um, I don't want to beat a dead horse. It will become evident, I think, as you go through um, some of the examples. OK, yeah, so you can see that uh, you do need to keep track of whether a node is a leaf node or a non-leaf node. An inner node, I think, is what we call them in NanoDB. Or empty. It could be that a node is empty as well. Since bee trees are able to grow and shrink very easily, we actually benefit from just keeping, fa uh, keeping track of the fact that it's an empty node. Okay, we could reclaim empty nodes off the end. We don't in NanoDB, but uh, you, you certainly could. You also need to keep track of which node is the root, because that can change over time. And so in NanoDB's bee tree implementation, again, we have schema. What is the search key? We have other details, what table is referenced, and so forth. All that goes into the page zero, the header page, and then we can use that 
to go to the root and start doing our navigation. And this is where you have to be very careful because like I say here, it is appealing to try to store additional structure in here. What's the previous node? if you're a leaf, so that I can go backward as well as forward. Or, who are my siblings? Okay? And it's important to understand the definition of who is a sibling when you're modifying these things. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to point that out in a subsequent slide, because it actually becomes very, very important to know who is a sibling and who is not a sibling. But the thing about this is remember that any little change increases the number of IOs you have to perform. So we don't even keep track of who's my parent. <laughs> Parents know children, and then when we navigate the structure in memory, we record. I saw this guy, and then this is the child, and then this is the child, and then this is the child. We record that in memory because that way we don't have to perform our IOs when we change the status structure. I split a node. Now I have to say who's a parent. I combine nodes. Now I have to say who's a parent. Uh, I split a node. Now I have to update the previous node as well as the next. More IOs. So we try to avoid all that by keeping our data structure on disk as simple as possible. Okay? There will be some examples that you have to think about in the... Um, this is the fifth assignment we're talking about now. So in the design document, there will be some questions where you can explore some of these things. And you'll see very quickly why we avoid having additional structure in these data files. Okay? So just be aware of that. It's kind of very important. Okay, this was our B-tree example. Yeah, so this is the other thing that's kind of bad about these files. So this is our B-tree, and it's like, yay, we go to the root, and we navigate from the root to our leaves and everything, and then maybe we... Um, one of the nice things is if I want to just scan the file's contents in sequence, I can just pass in an empty value V, because an empty tuple is always going to be less than the first thing in all of these things, and you end up falling into the leftmost node, and then I can just shoot across. Okay? But the thing is, is that that's a conceptual layout. This is a logical layout of our data file, but it is not necessarily the physical layout of the data file because we allocate pages on an as-needed basis, and sometimes we don't need a page anymore, so we remove it, and then we allocate it again. So think about it. That was the first page I added. Okay. Then what was the second page I added? Well, it would be dot gut, right? And then I had to create a parent because I had two new children, so now I had dot off. And then later on, I added enough stuff that would have fallen into dot gut that I had to split it into two as well. You could imagine any other ordering you could possibly generate by adding things in the right order. Except that bibcat will always be number one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you have this fact that since it started out as the root, it's always going to be one. Unless you were to delete bib, delete cat, now that page is empty, and you started adding stuff to off pit, and now it needs a new page, and so you use bibcat's page. And so now it would be two, four, one would be the order of pages that you would traverse. So you have a problem that over time, your B tree's physical layout may really be different from the logical layout of the file. I'm sorry, I got those backwards. The logical layout of the B tree may be very different from the physical layout of the file. Okay? Everybody see this? So you have to be very careful. You have to think about managing this data structure as you go through it. And so that's why right now NanoDB has an optimized hook for all the various file formats. You haven't gotten the B tree code yet. But when you do, if you want to implement an optimized thing, it's pretty straightforward. It's not very complicated to do the uh, optimization process because you basically just need to reorder these pages in an order that makes for friendly traversal. Usually scanning from the beginning to the end of the file is going to be generally friendly. Yes? Uh, that's a really good question. What would be the best ordering? I, I haven't really given a lot of thought to what would be an optimal ordering of these B-tree pages. Um, the one thing that I keep thinking is that it would be nice to group all the leaves together. So maybe you put the root as the first node and then everything on the second level 
as subsequent pages, and then everything on the third level as subsequent pages, and then keep all the leads together because you're frequently going to be doing sequential scans through leads. Uh, it's definitely possible. Oh, for arrays, yeah, um, I've implemented that for uh, the heap data structure. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I just really don't know. I mean, that would be something that someone could explore. There's so much that's left to add in NanoDB when it comes to indexing, and uh, that would be another great thing to explore. Yeah, that's what I would probably suggest: is leaves all together. So that when you do a, when you end up doing a sequential scan through the leaves, like you're doing a range query, it would be fastest. You wouldn't incur any seeks. Okay, deletion. Oh yeah, so I didn't really talk about inserting into parents. Let me see if I can uh, just give you a little bit of example. But you can see how it would basically follow the same process. Let's say I added enough stuff that the parent filled up, and then I needed to split it into two parents. Well, in that case, you need to think about um, creating a new parent above them. And so that's where you propagate up the, the leftmost key and pointer into the parent. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. I don't think that it's anything that would catch you off guard uh, having seen splitting leaves. Splitting non-leaves is not that much different. Okay, so non-root nodes always have to be at least 50% full. Deletion is a little bit complicated. Notice we have dipcat, dotcut not, offpit, rat tin. They're just fun to read. If we deleted something from, let's say, uh, where would we want to delete something that could actually affect things badly? Well, you can see how it would be easy to, to require a leaf to, to be redistributed or something like that. If I deleted cat, or I deleted bib, or I deleted rat, or I deleted tin, then that leaf would be too small. And I would need to do something to restructure the tree to satisfy my at least 50% full requirement. Same thing if I deleted enough from the right part of this, then I would need to somehow restructure things so that my non-leaf node, my second level non-leaf bat, has enough pointers. Because again, if I only have one pointer, there's no reason for the non-leaf. It doesn't give me any benefit, so I need to remove it. So these are kind of the challenges that we face. And again, typically, you know, because our nodes have, can store so many keys, like let's say I delete gut, nobody cares because it doesn't affect the structure of the tree. So, like again, the bulk of our deletions, just like the bulk of our insertions, will not modify the tree's structure. And those are good because then we don't incur the additional IOs of restructuring and our index is fast. Now, just before I jump into the next slides, I want to ask you, um, can you give me, can, can everybody see which leaf nodes are siblings of each other and which ones are not. To be siblings, they must have the same parent. So which leaf nodes are not siblings? There's only two leaf nodes here that are next to each other that aren't siblings. Yeah, off pit and rat tin are the two nodes that are not siblings. Okay. That becomes very important because, again, non-leaves can be siblings or they cannot be siblings. We have to think about this stuff because whether something is a sibling or not constrains whether or not it's available to use to try to satisfy these at least 50% full constraints. Okay, so let's say we delete dot. Okay, that's no big deal. We go ahead and navigate down to the leaf node containing dot, just like before, and then we remove it from that leaf. And we don't have any problem. Now there is an interesting caveat here. What do you notice about the fact that we just deleted dot from our, yeah. Yeah, it's still in the parent. Do we care? Well, I mean, we could care. I haven't said we don't care on the slides yet. But yeah, actually we generally don't care. It is not hard to go and fix those situations because you could basically say if I'm removing the first key from a node, then I might need to go and update my parents as well. But in practice, we just don't care. Because having dot there as the sentry value saying whether I go right or left is just as effective as having gut. <laughs> All right? So we could modify it. We really don't have to. And that saves IOs. We don't have to think about it. 
Yeah, so this is what I was just saying. Good catch, guys. All right. Um, if a node becomes too empty, yeah, we have several choices. So these are our choices, and again, we can only do this with siblings. <coughs> we can either re redistribute values. So let's say that I delete rat, or like I have in my example, I delete tin. I could delete rat or tin. Well, I have one sibling, and that sibling happens to have enough data that I could move data from the sibling into my node and then satisfy the fullness constraint. Everybody see that? So I could do that. <coughs> that is, unfortunately, the only situation we have here where we could do that. The other option is I could coalesce. So if I delete gut in this case, yeah, so you'll notice that I could delete gut, but then that leaf is too empty. It doesn't satisfy the at least half full constraint. So I have two choices. I could either, because it has a left and a right sibling, I could either coalesce not into the left sibling, which has available space, or I could coalesce it into the right sibling. Which should I choose? Well, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> I, actually, I think it might, because then you have like pointers to update. But you could, you could look into that yourself. So um, again, parents are affected when we do this, because we have to, yes, was there a question? Okay, well, I only have like one more slide, so we might answer it next time. But uh, basically, when we delete nodes or when we delete values, <clears throat> you can see uh, if I were to delete rat, that would affect a parent or could conceivably affect a parent if I redistribute values. Or if I coalesce, then clearly that affects a parent because then I have a pointer to something that doesn't exist anymore. So uh, what we will do next time, yeah, so we'll talk about all of these things. Next time we'll go into deletion and your head will start to spin and you'll be very glad that you don't have to implement this in NanoDB. Although I may make an extra credit to find the one bug that I have not tracked down yet. <laughs> Any questions? All right, we'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>